In 1980, Hai Min Lee was born to her mother, Young Kim, in South Korea. In 1992, Young Kim emigrated to the United States with Min Lee and her brother Young Lee in order to live with Min Lee's grandparents. In Maryland, Min Lee attended a specialized program at Woodlawn High School, where she played lacrosse and field hockey. On January 13th of 1999, Min Lee was supposed to pick up her younger cousin from daycare, but she never did. She had last been seen at school at around 2.15 p.m. The police began contacting various friends and acquaintances of Min Lee in an attempt to find her and they came across her ex-boyfriend, Annan Syed. Syed reported that the last time he had seen Min Lee was around the end of the school day. The police then contacted Min Lee's current boyfriend, who said he had returned home at 7 p.m. On February 6th, law enforcement conducted a search around the high school that was led by dogs. The authorities came up empty-handed, but that ended up not mattering. A woman discovered Min Lee's partially buried body in Leakin Park in Baltimore three days later. The police confiscated the remains and performed an autopsy, which revealed the cause of death was manual strangulation. On February 12th, the Baltimore City Police Homicide Division received an anonymous phone call that suggested the investigation should focus on Adnan Syed. One of Syed's friends, Jay Wilds, testified that Syed had expressed his desire to kill Min Lee and Wilds himself had assisted Syed in hiding the body. Anand Syed was arrested on February 28th and charged with first-degree murder. Syed's first trial ended in a mistrial after the jury overheard his defense attorney accusing the judge of calling her a liar. The second trial lasted six weeks, after which the jury found Syed guilty of first-degree murder, kidnapping, false imprisonment, and robbery. He was sentenced to life in prison with an additional 30 years. His appeal was ultimately unsuccessful. Syed argued that his defense attorney had failed to properly investigate a witness named Asia McLean, who had stated that she had seen Syed in the library at the time Min Lee had gone missing. This was an attempt to argue ineffective assistance of counsel, but the petition was denied by a judge who stated that McLean's timeline did not match up with Syed's own timeline, meaning their failure to call McLean was actually strategic. Syed filed a motion to appeal his case in the Court of Special Appeals, and the motion was granted. He proceeded to file a supplement asking for re-examination of cell tower evidence. The post-conviction hearing lasted five days and was attended by countless people from across the country. McLean testified that she had spoken to Syed in the library on the day in question, and the judge vacated his conviction, meaning he was no longer considered guilty. The Court of Special Appeals upheld the ruling that Syed should receive a new trial because of the incompetence of his previous defense attorney. The American judicial system is built around the idea of being innocent until proven guilty, and the defense had to be guilty beyond reasonable doubt. These proceedings raised reasonable doubt in the case. Other people within the judicial system disagreed with this decision because they did not think McLean's testimony would have changed the outcome of the original trial. The prosecution appealed to the Maryland Court of Appeals, which is now known as the Supreme Court of Maryland, and the court reversed the decision to grant Syed a new trial. This reversal was determined by a split 4-3 ruling. Although they agreed Syed's defense attorney had been ineffective, they did not think the verdict would have been different because Syed still had a motive and opportunity. On November 25th of 2019, the Supreme Court of the United States rejected Syed's appeal for a new trial, and the Maryland Attorney General stated that the evidence pointing to his guilt was overwhelming. In 2014, after the first season of a podcast covered Min Lee's case, The Innocence Project discussed the possibility of conducting DNA tests on physical evidence from the case. The Baltimore Sun obtained documents in 2019 showing that Maryland prosecutors had tested numerous items for Syed's DNA and they did not match. On March 10th of 2022, the Baltimore City State's attorney signed a motion that Syed's new defense attorney had filed requesting a court order for new DNA testing to be performed. A motion was eventually filed in September of 2022 to vacate Syed's conviction. The motion stated that the prosecution had suppressed evidence that indicated a different suspect and they had failed to reveal the identity of another suspect who had previously threatened Min Lee's life. On September 19th, a judge vacated Syed's conviction and he was released from prison. Young Lee, Min Lee's brother, appealed this decision because he did not think he had been given adequate opportunity to testify against Syed. Finally, on March 28th of 2023, Syed's conviction was reinstated in a 2-1 decision in the appellate court. All subsequent appeals by Syed were rejected, and he remains in prison to this day. This case has sparked massive amounts of controversy over the trials and appeals. Furthermore, debates over victim rights have been raised by this case. 
To this day, the case remains notorious for its convoluted nature and the widespread disagreement about the verdict. Many people believe that Syed was responsible, but many others disagree. It's unclear what the truth is, and it seems as if it will never be uncovered conclusively. Alex Skeel was born on August 17, 1995, with his twin brother. They were born prematurely and Alex weighed just two pounds. He was placed in intensive care and received numerous operations. Despite the difficulties surrounding his birth, Alex survived and would go on to become a child model for a supermarket chain while living in Stewart B, Bedfordshire. Alex attended college and met a girl named Jordan Worth. They were both 16 years old and they began dating. Worth ended up graduating from the University of Hertfordshire with a degree in fine arts and the hope of becoming a teacher. Worth became pregnant with Alex's child and they moved to Stewartby. However, their relationship was never quite what it seemed on the surface. Worth controlled every aspect of Alex's life. She told him what clothes to wear, commanded him not to contact his family, destroyed his phone, and took over his social media accounts. At one point, she told Alex that his grandfather had passed away. This was a lie that Worth was using to judge his response. Alex ended up crying because he thought his grandfather was gone, and Worth viciously berated him for caring about his family. She also physically assaulted Alex, creating multiple wounds and causing him to rapidly lose weight over time. A police officer eventually coaxed Alex into telling him the truth about his injuries, and Worth was thankfully arrested. In April of 2018, she pled guilty to controlling or coercive behavior in an intimate relationship, wounding with intent, and causing grievous bodily harm. She was sentenced to seven years and six months in prison. Many people argue that her sentence was extremely lenient given the extent of her crimes. The Court of Appeal determined that, even though her sentence was lenient, it wasn't unduly lenient, so the original sentence was upheld. In February of 2019, a report stated that Worth's Facebook account had continued posting while she was in prison. These posts regarded male domestic violence, indicating that she believed she was the victim. Despite her use of psychological control, verbal abuse, and physical punishment, Worth was somehow so deluded that she believed Alex was in the wrong. Worth was released from prison after serving half of her sentence, which is apparently very common in the UK. It's a terrifying thought to know that someone as sadistic and egocentric as Jordan Worth is out there somewhere, possibly looking for a new relationship. Fisher was born on April 13, 1961, in Brooklyn. He had two sisters, and both of his parents were involved in his life. That is, until they got a divorce in 1976 and the children moved to Arizona with their father. The divorce was turbulent and impacted the children for a long time afterwards. Robert himself felt bitter about the divorce and believed his life would have been drastically different if it had never happened. Robert was an outdoorsman who enjoyed activities such as hunting and fishing. He enlisted in the United States Navy and attempted to become a Navy SEAL, but he ultimately failed. He worked as a firefighter in California until he sustained a back injury, which forced him to retire. He took up work as a catheter technician and respiratory specialist, then as a weed sprayer. In 1987, Robert married a woman named Mary Cooper. They had two children together, Bobby and Brittany. Robert was extremely controlling and harsh with his family. On one occasion, he sprayed Mary with the garden hose because he believed she had spoken out of turn. On another occasion, he threw Bobby out of a boat in order to teach him how to swim. This sort of behavior persisted around the family home as well. Robert forbade Mary to paint the walls of their house any color other than white. He also forced his wife to store gifts from her mother in their closet, and he repeatedly made comments about how she should get rid of them. Robert's mother had stated that his family was very similar to their childhood family. According to her, she never stood up to Robert's father and simply obeyed him, which was the same dynamic between Robert and Mary. Mary's mother stated that Robert hardly ever socialized with others because he was scared of losing the people he loved. Unfortunately, this lack of socialization only made Robert's behaviors worse. 
on a hunting trip, he snuck up behind someone who was having a picnic and fired his gun into the air in order to scare them. One time, he shot and killed a pit bull, which he said had attacked his own dog. The police suspected he had arranged the encounter on purpose so that he would have an excuse for shooting the dog. Sometime during 1998, Robert began talking about suicide with his friends. He was worried about his marriage and he eventually went to a pastor in order to receive marital counseling. This strategy apparently did not work. Robert confided in his friends that he had a one night stand with a prostitute and got a urinary tract infection. He was worried that Mary would find out about the infection and begin asking questions. Their neighbors reported hearing Mary screaming at Robert on numerous occasions and claiming that she wanted a divorce. On April 9th of 2001, one of the Fisher family's neighbors reported hearing a loud argument at 10 p.m. At around 10.43 p.m., an ATM camera captured Robert withdrawing $280. In the footage, Mary's Toyota 4Runner was parked in the background. Nothing else of note happened until 8.42 the next morning when the Fisher family home exploded. The explosion caused the front brick wall to collapse and the neighboring houses shook from the impact. The neighbors attempted to keep the fire under control with garden hoses until the fire department arrived. When they finally did, they were forced to keep their distance from the house due to a series of secondary explosions, most likely caused by Robert's ammunition. Once they finally extinguished the inferno, they entered the house and came upon a scene of nightmares. Three burnt corpses were lying on a bed and they were identified as Mary, Bobby, and Brittany. Their cause of death was not the fire. Mary had been shot in the back of the head while the two children's throats had been slashed with a knife. The police theorized that Robert had murdered his wife in order to prevent her from divorcing him. Murdering the children would prevent them from experiencing the same pain that Robert had felt as a child. Robert was the only suspect in the murders. The Arizona Department of Public Safety was ordered to arrest Robert if he was found. On April 20th, Mary's car was found in Tonto National Forest. The family dog, Blue, was sheltering under the car. He was hungry and agitated, but he ultimately survived. An Oakland Raiders hat was in the car and it matched the hat Robert had been wearing in the ATM footage. A pile of human feces was found near the passenger door. Law enforcement scoured the surrounding area, but this proved to be very difficult. A complex and extensive system of caves was nearby and some people theorized that Robert had used the caves to hide out. Professional cave explorers conducted their own searches but came up empty-handed. A woman named Lori Greenback told the police that her husband had gone camping with Robert shortly before the murders in the same general area where Mary's car was discovered. Her husband believed Robert had been scouting out the area. A different couple reported seeing a man who matched Robert's description walking along Young Road in the general area, but they reported this too late for it to lead anywhere. On July 19th, a state arrest warrant was issued for Robert Fisher. On June 29th of 2002, he was placed on the FBI's 10 Most Wanted Fugitives list. They received hundreds of leads after offering a $100,000 reward for information about Robert's whereabouts, but none of these have resulted in an arrest. There are several theories regarding Robert Fisher's whereabouts following the triple murder. One theory suggests that he committed suicide somewhere deep in the wilderness, which would make sense given how much he talked about suicide in the months leading up to the murders. Another theory suggests that he may have used his wilderness skills to live in the forest, but law enforcement has stated that this is extremely unlikely. Yet another theory suggests that he may have assumed a new identity and started a new life for himself in a small town, possibly working as a handyman. To this day, Robert Fisher's whereabouts and well-being remain unknown. He is no longer on the FBI's most wanted list, but he is still considered a fugitive. It's chilling to think that somewhere in the world, Robert Fisher might still be alive, keeping the secret of how he murdered his entire family. Jamie Sue Scherer grew up in a large family with only brothers and no sisters, which caused her to have a special connection with her mother. She worked in the Human Resources Department for Microsoft and her co-workers never had any complaints. She was well-liked, had a great sense of humor, and showed affection. By 1990, Jamie was married to a man named Stephen Frank Scherer. The couple lived in Redmont, Washington with their son. In autumn of that year, Jamie decided to get a divorce. The marriage was far from perfect and she thought it would be for the best. On September 29th, she spent the night at her parents' house with her son. 
Stephen called Jamie and pleaded with her to reconsider the divorce. She agreed to meet with him the next day to discuss things. The following morning, Jamie left her son with her parents and met up with Stephen. At around 8.30 a.m., she called her mother and told her that Stephen had snatched her purse and run off. Jamie assumed he was going back to their house and she drove there. She called her parents again at around 11.45 a.m. to confirm that Stephen had gone back to the couple's home. Jamie called her parents one last time to tell them she was going to a restaurant called Taco Time before returning to their house. After this phone call, Jamie Scherer disappeared. About 30 minutes after Jamie's last phone call, Stephen called her parents to ask where she was. He did this again 15 minutes later. Jamie's mother stated that she was used to this sort of behavior. Stephen was extremely possessive of Jamie and would call her parents frequently when she was visiting them. However, Stephen did not call again until 6 p.m. when he told Jamie's parents that there was no sign of their daughter and he was coming to pick up his son. It was later discovered that by the time he made this call, he had already called his own family to inform them that Jamie was missing. The authorities discovered Jamie's abandoned car in a church parking lot in Shoreline, Washington. Her purse was missing, but her suitcase was still inside. It was packed with clothing, but there was no underwear. Stephen was the obvious suspect in the disappearance. Even his own friends reported that he was behaving strangely in the aftermath. Nine days after Jamie went missing, Stephen attempted to commit suicide via carbon monoxide poisoning, but he called 911 at the last second and he was rushed to the hospital. In the following weeks, he began dating other women and would frequently visit bars. He wore Jamie's panties around his arm and wore her necklace because, according to him, it made him feel closer to his wife. When it came to official documents, Stephen would report that he was a widower. He told some of his friends that Jamie had been killed in a car accident. He told others that she had been a victim of the Green River serial killer. None of these stories added up. Her car showed no signs of having been involved in a traffic accident, and there was no evidence linking her case to the Green River killer. At another point in time, he even told one of his friends that he was glad Jamie was missing. In October of 1990, Stephen took control of Jamie's finances and cashed all her assets. His own sister contacted the police and reported that there was a large red spot on Stephen's carpet. Law enforcement searched his home and found that a specific section of the carpet had been steam cleaned multiple times. A new piece of carpeting had even been placed over the spot that his sister had seen. Stephen's neighbors reported that he had hired a carpet cleaning company in the days following Jamie's disappearance. One of his friends reported that he had seen a shovel in Stephen's truck the day after the disappearance. Stephen's sister eventually reported that he had asked her to make an appointment for him with a priest because he had done something bad. Every piece of information seems to indicate Stephen's guilt, but the police simply did not have enough concrete evidence to arrest and charge him with the murder. Looking back through Stephen's personal history is incredibly disturbing when you consider the likelihood of his guilt. Stephen had been physically abusive to his former girlfriend. On at least one occasion, he had injured her so badly she had been hospitalized. After Jamie had started seeing Stephen, her family noticed a drastic change in her behavior. Under Stephen's orders, she bleached her hair blonde and got breast implants. He also restricted her time away from him. Jamie actually got fired from one of her jobs because Stephen frequently caused her to be late. During their marriage, Stephen would place advertisements for orgies in adult magazines and he pressured Jamie into consenting. He also asked his friends if they would be interested in engaging in group sex. Stephen's criminal record also continued to flourish during their marriage. He was charged with assaulting a police officer, burglary, theft, and numerous traffic violations in the 80s. He was also treated for alcoholism. In the 90s, he showed no signs of letting up. He sustained a gunshot wound in a bar fight, violated the terms of his probation when he used cocaine and refused to meet with his probation officer, and was given deferred prosecution for possession of crack cocaine. Stephen also used at least 12 different aliases during his life. In 1997, Jamie Scherer was declared legally dead and Stephen was arrested for first-degree murder. He was found guilty and sentenced to 60 years in prison. He has maintained his innocence throughout his time in prison, but his sentence was extended when he tried to have Jamie's parents' house burned down with his son inside. I don't think his claims of innocence have ever been taken seriously by anyone.